Of your boots and we'll chug on down to an knocked out shack on the edge of town. There's an AV combo that just won't quit. Keep walking till you see that blue light lit. And call in there and we'll see some sights. The house, the house, the house, the house of blue lights. Wow. Oh. That, no, that just gets me going. I mean, I just love, of course, that's Ray Benson with a sleep at the wheel uh, playing with Willie on House of Blue Lights. Um, the wheel will be at the first Willie picnic years later into our story, but um, the wheel will play uh, the stuff that Willie likes, which is Bob Wills and Texas Playboys Western Swing. Nice, nice. I wish we had tons of music. We can't, obviously. <laughs> no. but I will probably not even get away with that. I try to find some rare thing that may have been buried in YouTube somewhere. Uh, maybe we'll see if it's claimed. And folks, if uh, you're going, what are they talking about now? You probably need to go on another platform and look at the uncut video because if it gets claimed, I'll probably have to remove the stupid segment. And well, that's okay. We'll put it on locals, but well, let's get oh, going sure. here and pray for the best here. We'll put some more on locals. That I will at least uh, later in the day. Oh yeah, there's a ton of stuff. As I was trying to do pictures uh, for Mark, I just was commenting before the show that uh, Willie has been with everybody well especially the duets i mean we'll get into that but um it's funny i just to give you the lineage of this thing i have been watching I, I was telling eric i've been watching um uh, monk from beginning to end and uh just binging on monk uh, which i never did i don't know what i was doing at the time but uh, one of the episodes comes up where um i think it's season two where Willie Nelson is charged with killing his uh, road manager and uh, shooting him in an alley. And the Willie Honeysuckle Rose bus, well, I don't know what number that was, but um, there's about five of them. He gets out and the, he thinks the guy's ripping him off and he shoots and kills him uh, allegedly in the show. And it's just, I, I, it reminded me, this was about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And I started to, okay, what the heck is Willie doing in Monk? And, you know, I was just cracking up because he's innocent and some blind black woman who was making believe she was blind is really the person who kills the tour manager and revenge for the tour manager having killed her family 20 years before in a drunk driving accident. So Willie is cleared by Monk. But the real hook to the thing is and I, 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 I can't I can't even explain it, but I'm just going to tell you. Willie finds out that Monk plays clarinet and asks him to sit in in a studio session of Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. And I'm going, this is the, the most insane Monk episode of all time. So Monk gets his clarinet. He's rehearsing nonstop all week. He's driving everyone crazy. And they go into the studio and, and, and you know, the, to Willie, he's like really laid back. And everyone's playing their thing, Mickey Raphael on harp and, and Paul English on drums and, you know, the crew. And he points to Monk to take a solo and Monk freezes. And because of his OCD, can't take the solo on uh, the song that Willie's recording. Uh, the greatest Monk episode of all time. But that's what got me thinking about Willie again. And okay. Willie, I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, and Willie covers every part of my life growing up, and I didn't realize or remember just how important Willie was to me and America. Not just, you know, I wanted to do an upbeat show because we've had a lot of downbeat, uh, you know, murder stuff. But for the new year, I thought starting out with Willie Nelson, who's not going to be around much longer, who's being feeded uh with a 90th anniversary a uh, 90th birthday party on cbs the other night uh, the recording at the hollywood bowl for his 90th birthday i think it was done in april uh last night uh, i watched i got a little misty eyed last night he was inducted finally into the rock and roll hall of fame and it was a touching touching moment if anybody got to see that last night on abc uh i recommend finding that and and watching willie perform 
uh, on the show uh, with this band and Chris Stapleton and Mickey's there and uh, some other people, but a real touching moment for Willie to be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because Willie is in a lot of ways rock and roll and he is country and he is folk and he's got a lot of influences and he's kind of like a country Bob Dylan in a lot of ways. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, he even worked with Johnny Cash, who's the other another big crossover guy, rock, country, et cetera. Anyway, so ju just to go back and to look at Willie's life at this time, I thought it was appropriate. Um, we're going to get into the Highwaymen, which Eric is alluding to, uh, with Chris Christopherson, Johnny Cash, uh, and 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 that group that he put together with Waylon Jennings in 1985. Uh, that thing was a mega uh, super group uh, l later in his career. Uh, they toured for about 10 years as the Highwaymen. They made a movie called Stagecoach, a remake of the John Wayne movie with the four of them, which was not so good. But we'll get into Willie's movie career because he did over 30 films. And they weren't a lark for Willie. Uh, Willie worshipped movies. And he worshipped, uh, uh, you know, Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. And in fact, Trigger will come into this thing because Trigger is the name of Roy Rogers' horse, as every kid in America used to know, including me. Uh, who loved Roy Rogers and loved Dale Evans. In fact, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans um, were dragged into the Abby Hoffman American flag shirt case when Abby Hoffman was arrested for wearing an American flag uh, shirt. Uh, he pointed out that uh, Dale mm -hmm. Evans and Roy Rogers wore an American flag shirt. So it wasn't about the shirt. It was about your ideas. And Abby was uh, vindicated and cleared of the charges by pointing out Roy Rogers wearing the American flag shirt, which I always thought was, was funny. But anyway, Abbott, Texas, a little bit outside of Waco, uh, 1933. Uh, Willie's born there, very weird childhood. His father, uh, his mother is like three quarter Cherokee, just leaves. Uh, she's like a, a drinking, partying, car dealing uh, hustler. She just leaves the family within a, a year. He's got a sister who is roughly a couple of years older than him. He, uh, his father is a fiddler, and he also walks away from the family almost at the same time. The mother and father literally abandon these two kids separately. They fought like cats and dogs, but they both literally walk away from uh, uh, him and his sister, uh, 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 Bobby Nelson. And uh, Bobby is a musical child prodigy and is Willie. And they're both raised by their grandparents who are, Eric was just showing a photo. That's his grandmother uh, that Eric showed in that photo with Willie a little later on. So he, his parents uh, kind of drift in and out. His, his, his grandfather's a blacksmith and uh, he, they're really, really into the church. And this is really important for Willie, who never, ever uh, walks away from the church. In fact, he'll become a Sunday school, uh, uh, a Sunday school teacher in the church in, in Abbott at one point. But in 19, in, in high school, what happens with Willie and people think, well, he's this little guy, he smokes pot, had some tax trouble, played some songs. No, no, <laughs> that's not why we're doing the show. Let me tell you about Willie Nelson. Uh, this is him and his sister right here, uh, Bobby Nelson, who a uh, brilliant virtuoso piano player. Um, and they will play together in church, perform together and become kind of celebrities in Abbott at a very young age, being child musical prodigies. Um, both of them strongly influenced by gospel. And uh, like we we had with some other figures in this show. Uh, with Hank and 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 the Swaggart family and and uh, the church becomes so important because his grandmother uh, is such a, re a deeply religious woman and and so is the grandfather and they are on top of him from the time they take over his life about uh, uh, Jesus and the church itself. I I think there were Methodists uh, in Abbott, uh, but anyway, so within a couple of years, and it's just really hard to believe. Uh, but in high school, Willie Nelson is the star quarterback of the football team, the star shortstop of the baseball team, the star guard of the basketball team, and the star on the track team. He also delivers newspapers, and he also begins to writing songs at the age of seven. That's Willie 
uh, on the football team. At age seven, uh, the savant begins to write songs. And at the age of eight or nine, begins to put together Willie Nelson's uh, 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 music book with all of his lyrics. At the, <laughs> it's something you would do if you made it years later. Willie sees the future of where he's going at the age of seven, begins to put together a book of his songs, and will begin to go out into the nightlife and see what's going on. At the age of 14, at the age of 14, Willie Nelson books books. He puts on a concert at the age of 14 with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. And Bob Wills is, Bob Wills and Texas Playboys are the Beatles of Texas. I mean, let me tell you, you can't ex overestimate the enormity of Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. You know, Whalen will later write a song, uh, Bob Wills is still the king. And it's sort of a, a F you to Willie at one point because he felt Willie's head was getting too big, that Willie was the king of music in Texas. Uh, not that Willie ever said it, but the people around him in Austin uh, years later will begin to worship Willie and he will buy the Texas Aubrey House. He will put on these shows. And people in the media were saying that Willie was the king of country music in, in, um, in Texas. And uh, Whalen famously wrote, Bob Wills is still the king as a response to that. They, they were, of course, best friends. He, uh, Willie will later put him in rehab for cocaine, and we'll get to that <laughs> later in the in the show. But in, in Abbott, Texas, Willie puts on this show at the age of 14 uh, with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. 900 people show up. It's outside in a field. Uh, he doesn't make any money, but he doesn't care about that. He wants to see how a band leader functions with a large band. He wants to learn from his idols uh, uh, just how to run a band. And Willie's influences, even at the age of 12 and 13 and 14, are Frank Sinatra and, and Bob Wills and a guy named Django Reinhardt, who is a, a gypsy uh, a guitar player who plays in Paris, uh, who's like a jazz guitar player. Django famously uh, lost the use of these last two fingers in a fire and had to play with three fingers. And one of the greatest guitar players of all time uh, will record this Django Reinhardt, the gypsy in Spain. He will record with Stefan Grappelli, uh, one of the great swing violinists of all time. But these are the influences of a kid in Abbott, Texas. Uh, Willie is not who you think he is. Uh, Willie is a savant. He knows what he's doing, but he's also a hustler and a schemer, and, a, and, and the only thing, he, he kind of like Jimmy, like Jimmy Swaggart uh, and these guys, he has one foot in the Lord and one foot in illegal activity, uh, and he's doing both. And we see this continuously in a lot of the characters that we've looked at in the show, Southern characters that we've examined, and Willie's one of them. Uh, and Willie's not above uh, you know, doing nefarious things. He loves to be with hustlers. He loves to gamble. He loves to smoke anything. He's smoking leaves. He's smoking twigs. He's sm I swear to God, this guy would smoke anything. This was way before the weed. He was into smoking anything at all. And of course, the drinking. At the age of, I, I think at his first band is 1943. He joins a polka band. I don't know why there's a polka band in Abbott, Texas, but there seems to be a lot of checks. And I say checks like Czechoslovakia checks. Uh, uh, Johnny Raycheck is a, a Czech who has a huge polka band, and he hires Willie like at the age of 13 or 14 to be a, just a guitar player in the band. And he begins to see, he's playing polka music though, uh, and he begins to see what life is like just to be in a band. Um, but he puts out a single, I think in years later, his first single was Lumberjack, but way before he gets to that, Willie is, <laughs> this is unbelievable. At the age of 16, there's a Willie Nelson fan club of all the girls in Abbott High. They have a fan club of Willie Nelson, and he has done things with most of them. He is has a lot of girlfriends. In fact, I don't think there's a girl left in the high school at the age of 16 or 17 who hasn't been with Willie Nelson in Abbott, Texas. People don't realize who Abby, uh, who uh, Abbott, Texas, his hero is, is Willie, Nex uh, Willie Nelson. Uh, and he, you know, he wa he has so much ambition and so much drive. He's playing in this polka band and his and his, his grandmother, who's essentially his mother, says, I can't have you going out 
at night. You're 14 years old, Eric. You know, he says to him, she says, you, you can't do this. And he, what does he do? What's his day job? He's picking cotton in the fields with his entire family. They're all picking cotton. That's his day job. He makes $8 a week picking cotton. Uh, this is besides going to school, right? So he he says to his grandmother, uh, I have to go out. I have to learn this stuff. And she goes, I don't care. You, you got to stick with the Lord. You can't go to these nightclubs. It's ridiculous. And at, this is the height of the Depression, right? He's born in 1933. So it's like, you know, what year is this? 43, 45, I guess after the war. So it's like he's 14 or 13. Uh, and by the way, he they worshipped FDR. Uh, they would listen to the fireside chats. They thought FDR was, he thought FDR was his father somehow, that he was the, like, you know how people say like George Washington is the father of the country? Well, he took this literally with FDR. He thought that FDR was the actual father of the country at the age of nine or whatever. But he he's born in 33, so 43, he's 10, uh, 12, LB, uh, uh, FDR will die. Um, anyway, so she says, I can't have you going out there. You're, you're, you're too young to do this. And he says, you know, I'm making $8 a week, grandma, in the fields picking cotton. And she says, I don't care. And out of his pocket, he pulls $8. And he says, this is what I made last night. And she says, never mind. And he gives, <laughs> he gives her the $8, uh, which would be the equivalent of, you know, like whatever, $200 today, Eric, right? Sure. You're talking about 1945, $8. Uh, so he doesn't have to pick cotton anymore. But he doesn't mind hard work. He is involved in, what's it called? Future Farmers of America? Farm Aid. I don't, far, I don't know about Farm Aid. But <laughs> well, it, he started Farm Aid with John uh, Mellon King. Right, uh, uh, right. I'm just talking about in high school. There's a program oh. of people who are rural who know what I'm talking about. It's called F Future Farmers of America. And he is a future farmer of America. Uh, and he becomes a farmer later on himself uh, in terms of raising pigs and not not crops. He begins to raise pigs. And he says at one point, there's nothing greater than just watching pigs. <laughs> there was just the most entertaining thing he says. Is, he says watching pigs play around in the mud is like the greatest thing in the world. Now, I, that might be a Texas thing. I'm not really sure how great that is. But this guy worships pigs. Uh, anyway, so he begins to uh, put write songs and he begins to try to peddle these songs. And it, he, he in 1950, before he even can get there, he has to join the Air Force, which I'm going to get to in a second. There's, there's Willie in the Air Force. But right before this, he goes to Portland, Oregon, and he becomes a DJ up there. Uh, and he, he starts working as a DJ and he does it after the Air Force, too. He becomes a pretty big DJ. He wants to be a DJ. He he says, this gives me access to all this music. I could play around with the equipment. I could record my music. I could send shit out from here to different things. Think about it, Eric. It'd be, it's a great base of operations for someone who's a singer songwriter is to be a DJ and, and, to, and to have like a little a job, put it that way, a weekly paycheck uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. And... Um, to be around every record that's in the walls there that you're, you're you know what I mean? Well, it every allowed, manager coming to town with every band would come right, to the radio right. station. It's just a great idea. Unfortunately, he's got to go to Oregon to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, he doesn't even mind being in Portland, Oregon. He, he, this is great. At the age of 14, he joins a band. This guy, Bud Fletcher shows up. Bud Fletcher marries his sister, uh, Willie's sister. And Willie's sister is 16. Uh, and she marries a guy who's older than her, and she's it's happened all the time. This is going to happen to Willie, too. Uh, but she's 16 and she's married and in high school, which is very common. I mean, having young mothers back, I mean, my mother was 18 when she had me, but this is 16. And and he puts together a band, Bud Fletcher and the Texans, and Willie's in the band at the age of 14, and he's learning to play with his sister, uh, and, and learning what it's like to be in a band with that group. And, and then, you know, while he's in that group, he begins to, uh, uh, he sees that he gets a draft card, uh, not a draft warning, but a letter, and he signs up for the Air Force in 1950. So that photo, which you, if you could show that again in 1950, this is kind of interesting, because he, he, he will get into a fight with a, uh, an officer and lose a stripe within a week. Uh, yeah, 
he thinks he's going to fly a jet and kill commies in uh, North Korea. Uh, that's his goal. But he realizes that it's a little too authoritarian for him. And that's what he will rebel against his entire life. Um, he's kind of a libertarian politically. I know people think he's a liberal, uh, but at this point, he is a patriotic American who wants to kill commies. And he, he, he's in there for about nine months. But the funny thing, the reason, one of the reasons you say, well, what does this have to do with the Kennedy assassination? Why am I watching this show, Eric? You know what I mean? You guys do these other things. And okay, he gets, in 1950, he gets sent to uh, the radar school in Biloxi, Mississippi and joins the squadron. I think it's 3838, I forget the actual name, something with 3880, 3880 or something. And he goes to that uh, Biloxi, Mississippi radar school in 1950, and there he's going to train to be a radar operator. It turns out it's the exact same uh, school and base that Lee Harvey Oswald will go to in 1957. Thanks for stopping by, Eric. The, uh, <laughs> the link between him and Oswald has been made here today between Willie Nelson. Now, obviously, Oswald will go there seven years later, but I just find it an odd coincidence that this is the same a base and the same training that Lee Harvey Oswald will take to Atsugi, Japan, and Willie Nelson will eventually abandon and go back to uh, 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 Abbott, Texas. Uh, so he gets out of the Air Force uh, rather quickly after about nine months, and uh, he had injured his back. He fell out of a tree. He was doing tree trimming. There's not a job in this country that Willie Nelson, physical job, that Willie Nelson has not done as a as a worker. I mean, he was a tree trimmer. I mean, just crazy, crazy, hardworking guy. Uh, but in 1956, he puts out his own single from this radio station called Lumberjack that sells about 3,000 copies. Uh, and he's just screwing around. He doesn't know how to do this. But he marries a full Cherokee Indian named Martha. And they're battles. Uh, I don't know if you have a picture of Martha, his first wife. This is Martha. She's a, a full Cherokee. And they will fight tooth and nail. And he said at one point, uh, because of his own carousing and drinking, and hers too, uh, she will do the same thing. Uh, Martha would tie him to the bed and beat him with a broom handle. When, In other words, he would pass out, come home at five in the morning, uh, pass out from being drunk in bed, and she would rope him to the bed and begin to beat him savagely with a broom handle. So, and this relationship goes on for a while. I, I mean, I, 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 they were married from 1952 to 1962, uh, him and Martha. And uh, a lot of these, he's got four wives and we'll get into all four ladies. So you will not be gypped of the wives today. So the, in fact, we could do the ladies. It, this is this is Willie when he goes to Nashville, but he's not really in Nashville yet in this story. But just to focus on six, on fifty two to sixty two, with Martha, uh, he's cheating on her. She's cheating on him. Uh, it, it's it's just a war, just a complete war. Now his mother, of course, was Cherokee or three quarter Cherokee. Uh, Willie's mother. So uh, there's a lot of uh, Native American. Native American blood going on uh, in the Willie Nelson, the Willie Nelson household. So anyway, so just getting back to Willie's influences, I mean, these include Ernest Tubb and, of course, Hank uh, that we discussed and um, uh, uh, Sinatra, which is where Lefty Frizzell, obviously, uh, the, the Django jazz stuff. He's into Ellington. He's into Basie. Uh, and he he has a weird, weird singing style. Because he believes that Frank Sinatra, which is true, Sinatra made his bones by being the greatest phraser of lyrics of all time. Sinatra was able, you know, to phrase lyrics and manipulate them in real time. Uh, and that's what Sinatra is really known for. I mean, he has, a bar he has a deep voice and he's attractive and everything else. But the singing style of Sinatra was the phraseology. And that's kind of what Willie is. But he doesn't have that deep voice like Sinatra. He doesn't look like Sinatra. And uh, nobody can figure out what to do with Willie's singing voice. But he is an incredible songwriter. And that's really how he makes his bones. And it, it, the first song he ever sells is, uh, uh, <laughs> is Family Bible. And Family Bible is recorded by a, a female artist named Claude Gray. Family Bible, he sells for $50. And it goes to number one on the charts. And, and he sells that in 1959, and that starts to give him some royalties. And, and if you 
just to, just to give you the idea of the poetry of Willie at a young age, I'm just going to read you the short lyrics of Family Bible uh, because it goes to the heart of Willie's Christianity and it goes to the heart of his uh, upbringing as a lover of Christ. There's a family Bible on the table. Each page is torn and hard to read, but the family Bible on the table will ever be my key to memories. At the end of the day, when work was over and when the evening meal was done, dad would read to us from the family Bible and we count our many blessings one by one. I could see us sitting around the table uh, when from the family Bible dad would read. I can hear my mother softly singing Rock of Ages, Rock of Ages cleft for me. Now this old world of ours is full of trouble. This old world would also better be if we'd find more Bibles on the tables and mothers singing Rock of Ages cleft for me. And, you know, if you, if you begin to see where Willie's coming from, uh, he is deeply, deeply spiritual and deeply into God. And he talks about God nonstop throughout his life. And everybody looks at him as this stoner and this drunk and this guy. That's not Willie Nelson. Uh, Willie Nelson begins to explore later, which we'll get into, other areas of Christianity that takes him into a really weird uh, offbeat uh, Christian sect. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say sect, but some sort of theology diving that he does leads him to uh, some sort of revelations. But at this point, he's in Nashville and he's selling these songs or attempting to sell these songs, literally going door to door. Uh, and he hooks up with, uh, you know, mu music publishing company. He hooks up with Ray Price. Now, Ray Price, uh, who will record Nightlife, uh, one of the first big mega hits of Willie Nelson, who wrote Nightlife. Ray Price is the leader of a band called the Cherokee Cowboys. And, and just to give you the lineage back to Hank Williams, so people know if you want to watch our Hank Williams episode that Eric and I did, here's a picture of Lee, here's a picture of Willie, and that's Ray Price in back of him. Willie Nelson here in the first big band he was ever in. That's the Cherokee Cowboys. Now you say, who are the Cherokee Cowboys? Well, Ray Price used to be in the Drifting Cowboys, Hank Williams band. When Hank died, Ray Price took over the band and changed the name to the Cherokee Cowboys. Willie Nelson will later join this band, which is already fully established, in the Cherokee Cowboys, giving him a link uh, indirectly to Hank Williams. Uh, so Ray Price will be a huge influence and a, a mentor to Willie Nelson as the straight country Willie of Nashville. Uh, he will sell nightlife to Ray Price, and that will become a huge hit. Uh, Nightlife, one of the greatest songs ever written, uh, if anybody wants to listen to Nightlife. It's been covered by uh, hundreds of artists by, at this point, but one of the one of my favorite songs of all time. Uh, the, the, the discography of, of Willie Nelson is just insane. He made and sold, Eric, over 300 albums. Uh, so, and, and the duet albums, were, I mean, he did albums with Julio Iglesias. I mean, obviously with Merle, obviously with, the, with everybody. I mean, his best... His initial best friend, once we get out of Nashville, but I'm not going to get out of Nashville yet, because in 1961, he sells a song to Farron Young called Hello Walls, and he had recorded Hello Walls himself. But people are not into Willie Nelson's singing, and the real money, he puts out a number of albums, and he has recording contracts in Nashville, but none of these albums really explode or take off. They sell very little. But he's starting to get huge royalties because of Hello Walls, because of uh, a, a song that he will sell to Patsy Cline uh, called Crazy that he plays for her husband and says, let's go wake her up right now. Uh, Willie Nelson will go into a studio, uh, into a manager's office, and they'll say, what do you have? And he will peel off Family Bible. He will peel off a uh, 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 nightlife he will peel off crazy and just play them five songs until their jaws fell open and you know this is what he's doing and yet you know he 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 doesn't mind selling the songs because he's making a lot of royalty money right now i mean when patsy klein does crazy of course goes to number one on the charts willie nelson's getting tons of money i mean he's getting royalty up the gazoo he buys a farm outside of nashville a ranch and he's got a huge house and he's in there and i i think <laughs> Uh, Martha is now gone, and he's on to the second wife, who is Shirley Colley. Uh, well, maybe not, because that's 1963. So around there, 62, Martha has had enough. 
And and there's a second wife that comes in named Shirley Colley. Now, Shirley Colley, this is Shirley Colley. She's an established star by herself. And she has sung with Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. She's got an incredible voice. Willie and her bond musically. Uh, he hooks up with her. And she becomes Willie Nelson wife number two. Um, and these overlap. He doesn't really get divorced from one before he starts the other one. Yeah, she was a knockout. That's, Sh that's Shirley Colley. Anyway, so they buy, they buy this farm thing outside of Nashville. Willie's in a club somewhere uh, just shooting pool, and he gets a call on the phone from his nephew saying the house is on fire. And uh, the entire house that he spent quite a bit of money on and the ranch, the main house is engulfed in flames. And Willie calmly says to the nephew, he says, he says, see my car out in front? He goes, yeah. He says, I want you to roll that car into the garage. And the kid goes, what? He goes, yeah, we're going to collect the insurance money on the car. We might as well. <laughs> so the kid, I swear, that's what I'm talking about, about Willie. He's a gambler. He loves to play cards. He's a, you know, he's drinking. This is drinking, gambling, Willie. So the nephew with the house on fire drives the car into the garage. Willie shows up. He's about 20 minutes away. He shows up. And what does Willie do? The firemen are there. And it's, and it's engulfed in flames, completely engulfed in flames. Uh, the house is gone. There's nothing you could do. Willie races past the firemen. And they're going, no, don't go in there. Races into his bedroom. And there's two guitar cases. Two guitar cases. One has trigger in it. And the other one has 2.2 uh, pounds of pure Colombian weed. <laughs> and he ra runs out with the two guitar cases past the firemen and into his car and goes back to the bar and the house burns to the ground. And that's in, that's in 1970. Uh, but Willie at that point had it when around, I want to say whiskey river, when whiskey river comes out in 72, Willie realizes he's got to give up drinking. Uh, when he's at Tootsie's one night, which is the bar across from the Raymond auditorium, he's so drunk. Uh, he lays down on the street in the snow and gets covered with snow, passes out in the middle of the road. Uh, luckily nobody ran him over. Uh, but the, the house burning down, I think he took it as a sign that it was time to get out of Nashville. But just to talk, I just want to talk about Trigger for a second, because Trigger is like a family member. And, and all the Nelson people will talk about Trigger. Um, that's Trigger roughly now. That's what kind of like Trigger looks like. And Trigger is a, uh, a Martin guitar, a classical Martin guitar, uh, technically an N20 doesn't have a pick guard because classical guitar players do not use a pick. But he like he buys it for seven hundred and fifty dollars in Nashville in, in nineteen sixty nine. Eric, so I mean, do the math on that. How much is that guitar? Um, quite a bit. So anyway, so he buys this Martin, and he likes the way it sounds. And uh, there's a guy in Austin who still repairs it to this day. Uh, I think his name is Mark Earlwine, who's still his guitar tech, who still has to repair it. If you go back to that photo, I'll just show what, ha what happens here. If you see that hole, that's normally where there would be a pick guard. Now, this is a an amplified guitar. They have pickups on it that they use. So Willie can play as loud as he wants, like he's playing an electric lead guitar in a band. So it's not like he's playing an acoustic that's not uh, uh, amped up. It is. However, when he's picking, that picking there, especially as, as Mickey Raphael said, when they would be doing um, uh, Bloody Mary Morning and, and one of the, the songs where there's a lot of heavy picking, he said, uh, Mickey, there's the harp player, Mickey Raphael, my hero. Uh, he, he would say that shards of wood would be coming flying off the guitar like shrapnel. It was a great description. And so anyway, where there's a pick guard, there's holes there. And the guitar tech guys would always want to patch it up. And Willie would say, no, I need a place to put my fingers half jokingly. But he meets a guy named Leon Russell and, and Leon Russell is at Oklahoma. And my first rock God that I ever went to the first concert I ever went to was Leon Russell, uh, Leon Russell. I worshiped Leon Russell. He was like uh, unbelievably a big star for me. And uh, Leon Russell becomes the best friend of Willie Nelson. And Leon Russell will, if you could just go back to that guitar for a second, Leon Russell will say to Willie, 
you should have people autograph Trigger. So Willie goes, okay, and he gives Leon a magic marker. And he goes, no, 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 no. Have them do it with a ballpoint pen and scratch their names into the guitar so it'll be permanent. And in there, in this guitar, is every famous country music star in the history of Nashville and Leon Russell and others. Now, he will later, just to, again, drag myself into this thing, we were at the Lone Star Cafe. This must have been, you know, I want to say like late 80s in New York, and Willie was playing. It's a small club. And we were sitting right in the front and watching Willie play. Tiny, tiny stage, uh, small place. And um, Willie uh, asked my friend Michael Simmons, the legendary Michael Simmons, at National Lampoon, also invented country punk, to get up and sing. And he hands Michael that guitar. I almost fell off the, the chair. Almost, I almost passed out. I couldn't believe it. it was like so surreal. And Willie goes, ah, I'd like to get Michael Simmons up here now. And Michael goes up and plays Nightlife or whatever. I forgot what he played on that guitar. And I'm watching my best friend playing this guitar, Willie Nelson. I just thought, God, my life is so surreal, Eric. Anyway, that, that, I just wanted to get that Trigger story in because Trigger, if you listen to Mickey, Raphael, and the other members of the band, he and Willie, they talk about Trigger as a person. And, and many people have said if Trigger goes, the band goes. And later on, when he has the trouble with the IRS, he's got people hiding Trigger in Hawaii. The IRS is trying to seize the guitar, uh, among everything else, which I'll get into. But this is a guitar he purchases in 1969. This is a guitar last night on ABC he was playing while being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's really touching to see his worship of this instrument uh, to this day, how it's a family member called Trigger, which is the horse of Roy Rogers, which is where Willie gets it. And Willie worships country and Western uh, movies, you know, uh, all those different movies. And he will later, uh, with the help of, 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 of uh, Robert Redford, get into his first movie uh, uh, and begin to do movie, mo uh, mostly Western movies, but then some later stuff that, that are not Westerns. But he becomes, yeah, it, it's there's Electric Horseman, I think, is, is directed by Sidney Pollack. And um, it's, uh, what's his name? What's in Jane Fonda and Robert Redford. He meets Redford and Sundance. They bond over horseback riding or whatever. He gives him a part in this movie. Uh, he will later do Honeysuckle Rose, which was supposed to be Robert Redford. He will replace Robert Redford and do a movie... Uh, with Amy Irving and um, uh, Diane Cannon called Honeysuckle Rose, which is a great movie uh, where he plays a character not unlike himself in a bus, uh, you know, driving around being a country star. And uh, his wife is Diane Cannon. And he's cheating on her with Amy Irving. Ladies, I recommend Honeysuckle Rose for the weekend. If you can find that movie, it's a studio picture. Uh, so the, the standards are up to snuff. He will later uh, create redheaded stranger but i'll get to that and he makes a movie out of redheaded stranger it's kind of interesting but his connection with leon russell musically uh and spiritually is a big deal because leon russell they they decide to do uh when he moves out of nashville him and leon russell to decide to do a concert at uh, dripping springs uh dripping springs uh i don't know the texas people probably know dripping springs is outside of Austin. It's kind of between, uh, it's kind of between uh, LBJ's ranch and Austin. It's kind of in the middle there. If I got my coordinates right, my Texas people can, can verify that. Uh, and they, and Dripping Springs becomes the site of um, a festival that they're going to put on because they get hip to these rock festivals. So Willie Nelson and Leon Russell bond and <laughs> Leon Russell famously says, I'll bring the hippies, you bring the rednecks and we'll see what happens. And they're, they build a stage and nobody shows up. And about noon, there's 12 people and they go, holy shit, we're going <laughs> to gonna lose everything we invested into this thing. And all of a sudden, around noon, people start to come. And I mean, tens of thousands. It, it's, it's a big deal. And he's got a huge group on the bill. I don't remember every single name, but I know the wheel was on there. And this begins a series of uh, what Texas people know are the Willie Nelson picnics. 
Now, 1974 is when I first got exposed to Willie when I was in college and I had so there's Willie and Leon. Yeah, one for the road. Yeah. They become spiritually bonded at the hip. And uh, so that was my link to Willie Nelson was going through Leon. Uh, and Leon would obviously had a lot of uh, uh, country roots himself coming out of Oklahoma. Um, but like I said, in 72, he, he record he he writes uh, and records Whiskey River and begins to give up whiskey um, and switch over to pot when he gets to, when he gets to Austin. Um, he 1973, he signs a deal with a label called Atlantic. Atlantic is run by Jerry Wexler. And Jerry Wexler says to him, record whatever you want. I'm not going to step on your toes. I'm not going to do anything. Uh, and they open up an office in Nashville, um, uh, Atlantic, and he gets on their label. And the first album he does is Shotgun Willie, which is probably of the three Willie Nelson albums, uh, uh, Stardust, Shotgun Willie, and and um, uh, uh, the Redheaded Stranger are probably the top three Willie Nelson albums of all time. Now, there's the Outlaw Records uh, that he does with Whalen, uh, but those are kind of patched together from previous recordings and stuff of that nature. So when Shotgun Willie comes out, uh, he's got a, a kind of a hit album. It doesn't go ballistically crazy, but it's critically acclaimed. And I think that's what what really puts him on the map as, as an album creator. Now, Willie, just to get into the, the, the changes that he goes through, when he moves back to Texas... Uh, after the fire that burns down his his, his ranch house in uh, Nashville, he begins. This is becomes country Willie. This becomes hippie Willie. Country Willie becomes hippie Willie, and he grows his hair long, and 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 begins to just wear blue jeans and neckerchiefs and uh, putting his hair in braids, and begins to smoke pot and begins to hang out with these kids. And, and, and Austin is already a hippie hangout, Eric. And this is 1971, 72, Austin. Now, keep in mind, in 1973, if you think about it, when I first, uh, 73, 74, when I first discovered Willie Nelson, he's already 40, Eric. He's twice the age of these kids who are into him. So, I mean, he is like a fish out of water. And he doesn't you know, put on airs in terms of wearing jeans and T-shirts. He just says, I'm done wearing suits and ties. Like that photo you showed in Nashville, if you could show that, some of the early uh, uh, photos of Willie in Nashville. He is a short-haired, yeah, I mean, that he that's how he played. You know, with turtlenecks and a sport jacket. He, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a recording thing, so he's not really doing much there. But yeah, I mean, that's the straight Willie. It's kind of like the straight George Carlin. I was thinking George Carlin, uh, literally, <laughs> with that suddenly hippie overnight, et cetera. Yeah, that's kind of what happens. But it's not overnight because Willie begins uh, when he's in, 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 in Austin. He begins to dig deeper into Christianity. And he gets into two guys, and it's really strange. He gets into a guy named Edgar Case. Uh, I don't know if you have a picture of Edgar Case, but Edgar Case is a guy um, along with Khalil Gabron. This is Edgar Case. Or who, Casey is. No, well, it's pronounced Case, apparently. Not Casey. It's pronounced Case. There's two different guys. Edgar Case is a guy who is um, has seances, uh, begins, to, uh, uh, begins to get into uh, all kinds of mysticism, and believes, and this is what Willie gets into. You can look up Edgar Case later after the show, C A Y uh, 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 C E. He begins to uh, believe in the writings of Edgar Case that Jesus went to India and had another wife and additional children in India and got reincarnated. And Willie begins to be believe in reincarnation. And uh, although he worships Jesus his whole life, he goes down this Edgar Case route of Jesus's life that's not the biblical story of Jesus Christ. Uh, however, Willie, like I said, was teaching Sunday school way before this. He he gets fired by the um, minister in the Sunday school in Abbott, Texas, because the guy says, I can't have you coming from the bars and saloons at night on Saturday night to teach kids 
the Bible on Sunday morning. And Willie goes, why not? And he says, it's just not right. And he has this little kerfuffle with the minister, and then he's fired uh, teaching teaching uh, uh, Sunday Bible school in Abbott, Texas, which is kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, so he begins to explore. Uh, is that uh, 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 Gabriel? Right. And by the way, Casey's center is here in Virginia Beach. I'm pretty familiar with him. <laughs> okay. So I, again, I think it might be Edgar Case, but we could look it up after. That's what Willie calls him. So I'm just going with what Willie says. Um, anyway, so Khalil Gabrine, uh, uh, Gabron is, is another one who wrote the book, The Prophet. Uh, he's another spiritual philosophical um, uh, mentor for Willie Nelson. So uh, Willie Nelson, and, and I think he's Lebanese, uh, uh, Gabron, um, if I'm not mistaken. And The Prophet becomes one of his major, major books. Uh, anyway, so Willie goes down this rabbit hole of these Christian offshoots, I have to put it that way. I don't know how else, else to describe it. And he begins to smoke a lot of weed. Somebody comes up to him and gives him acid. Now it's Willie Nelson on acid. So Willie Nelson doesn't know about acid. And the guy says, here, uh, why don't you try this? And he does. He takes the whole hit, puts it in his mouth. And the guy goes, no, no, no. But it's too late. Uh, he wanted Willie Nelson to cut it up into thirds. Uh, into 500 microgram thirds, but it was 1,500 micrograms and way too much. I mean, even for me, I think the most I ever took was 1,000. And that was, you know, a four-way window pane that you're supposed to cut up with a scissor, as my uh, lysergic friends are going to remind me in the comment section tomorrow about acid. Um, the, the guy who was giving it to him wanted him to take a third of it and and cut it up. Uh, I don't know what form it was in. It was a, some might have been a some sort of purple barrel or something. I figure a micro dot, but whatever it was, Willie is now on an acid trip from hell, and he is you know hallucinating his balls off, and he starts to freak out. Um, he's really massive, massive colors, massive tripping, uh, and he's in Austin. And he begins to get scared and he realizes intuitively that it's better to just lay back and not fight this thing. Because the more he fights it, he realizes that this is going to be going on for hours. And he decides to just sit back and watch the uh, fireworks, which he does. And he kind of talks himself down from a bad trip internally. And he's able to enjoy the colors. And, but he's so terrified, never did it again. It's the only time Willie Nelson ever did acid was this one time. Uh, which is kind of interesting because there, there are other people that we've done shows on um, who did acid just one time and bailed out. Uh, a comic uh, named Mort Saul told me the same essential story, but he was dosed with punch. So that was a different thing. But Willie just took the whole thing before he could get to cut it up. So Willie now has given up drinking. He's into the spiritual quest. He's smoking weed. Uh, and he's got a manager who's not really doing much for him. And he gets a guy, what's his name? Uh, Will and Jennings says to him, you got to check out my manager. And, and Jennings is making a ton of money. And Jennings says, you got to check my guy out. He's from New York. He's a pit bull. He's a savage animal. And his name is Neil Reshen. And Neil Reshen is a guy who goes into uh, uh, RCA and tells them this is the way it's going to be for uh, uh, Will and Jennings. And uh, he says he's going to get this royalty. He's going to get that. He's going to do this. He's going to have creative control. Nobody had ever done this before. It broke the back. Neil Reshen broke the back of the Nashville stranglehold on artists uh, in terms of royalties, in terms of control of creativity. So he tells Willie, you got to get Neil Reshen. Neil Reshen becomes Willie's manager. And the two of them go to uh, the record label and they get Willie uh, the same incredible deal that they got Waylon Jennings. And he is one of the most powerful managers in uh, uh, country music, Neil Reshen. Now, Neil Reshen loves cocaine. And <laughs> Neil Reshen has a neck beard, a neck beard, and he's a Russian. And he lives on West 57th Street and parties day and night. These guys are in, you know, in Texas doing their thing. And Neil Reshen is partying in New York uh, with all this money. And it turns out that he doesn't pay the IRS a cent. He keeps he does he keeps deferring, you know, getting an extension on Willie Nelson's taxes year after year after year, and never pays them anything. And Willie is oblivious to this. He has no idea uh, uh, what's going on. 
uh, later on, we'll, we'll get to it. This will become a problem. But uh, Neil Reshin, for the most part, uh, puts Willie Nelson into a category of money that is in the stratosphere. Willie Nelson begins to buy houses, condos, golf courses, property in Maui, uh, you know, with all the money that he's earning, uh, he begins to uh, become a multimillionaire. Uh, there's Neil Reshin on the left. There's, of course, Waylon Jennings in the center uh, and Willie on the right. Uh, Waylon uh, will also join Willie, at, and he drags his friends out of Nashville. Waylon will become one of the outlaws. Jesse Coulter is Waylon's wife. Tom Paul Glazer, uh, Ray Wiley Hubbard, who's there. Uh, the, the list goes on. Of course, a legendary uh, Billy Joe Shaver, who has to get a shout out. One of the greatest uh, uh, country stars of all time, Billy Joe, one of my favorites, Billy Joe Shaver, who is not involved with this uh, story. But the festival that they put on that with, with Leon Russell's and Dripping Springs, which I think is Route 290, becomes this annual picnic that Willie puts on every year. And Willie puts on this picnic and people who have gone, I've never been there. But people who have gone to the picnic, uh, you know, it's a multi multi star event with various country people, and 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 it's you know I think it's usually on July fourth, which happens to be uh, Willie's birthday. Although that's debatable as to what his birthday actually is, but July fourth was the birthday of the country, so I, I think that's probably why I did it. Uh, anyway, so you know Willie's got this manager, and things are going really really well for him. And in 1975. He puts together another, uh, uh, well, there's one before that, uh, uh, Phases and Stages, which is a concept album. On one side, it's two people getting divorced. On one side is the woman's point of view. The second side of the album is the man's point of view. One, a great, great, great creative album. Uh, this is before Redheaded Stranger comes out. But Redheaded Stranger is a concept album about a preacher who's seeking revenge on uh, 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 on uh, people who killed his wife, stole his horse, and everything else. The redheaded stranger. He records this album, and it's very spare. It's very simple. You just hear Mickey playing harp. Uh, Mickey Raphael, the legendary harp player. By the way, Mickey Raphael shows up. I think he's in high school and uh, begins <laughs> just to get into the band a little bit. Mickey Raphael shows up in high school and and he says, "You mind if I sit in?" So he plays with them for a couple of years. And um, uh, Willie says to Paul English, the drummer, he says, how much are we paying this kid? And Mickey and, and Paul English says nothing. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, we don't pay him anything. He just shows up. And he goes, all right, double his salary. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. But Paul English, if you could show me a picture of Paul English with the black hat, I just got to tell you about Paul English, legendary drummer for Willie Nelson, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, as did uh, Willie's sister. A couple of these people literally died recently. Paul English had been arrested. This is Paul English. He kind of looks a little bit like Whalen. Uh, complete outlaw. And I mean outlaw. Uh, there's Willie with, with Paul English. Paul English, before the age of 16, he grew up in, in Fort Worth, was arrested over 100 times. Uh, he was a pimp. He carried a 357 Magnum and another gun. And he was the enforcer of the band. Uh, anytime this band got into trouble or Willie got into trouble, uh, which was not unusual for this band of drinking and carousing and womanizing of different hijinks that happened with Willie, uh, Paul English was the guy that physically, physically was the enforcer of Willie Nelson and the family. He doesn't, he didn't like the word band, Willie. He called them his family instead of band. And uh, this is all an extended family. And Willie will talk about all four wives will never leave his life. Uh, he got along with all of them. There was never uh, the massive acrimony. Uh, they all got over it. Um, and I, I guess he had enough money to go around. So they were kind of, you know, placated by that. Uh, but, you know, Paul English will stay with him till the till the end. Uh, Mickey Raphael, who still looks amazingly great. He was uh, it just one of my favorite heart players of all time. I worship Mickey. Uh, if I could play like Mickey, I wouldn't be doing this show. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Uh, Mickey's hero was Merle Haggard's harp player, uh, and and I I mean the sounds that that come out of uh, Mickey Raphael's harps are just can make you cry. I mean he's yeah. that good, and he becomes the voice 
of the reflection of Willie's voice. The harp is an echo of Willie's voice, but that's that's a little bit inside the game. Uh, anyway, so Mickey Raphael is there, Jody Payne on guitar. Uh, uh, um, the band, you know, has a what's his name B on um, uh, uh, B Spears on bass. Uh, another kid who joins the band and Bobby Nelson on piano. Uh, that becomes the core of Willie Nelson. And he will open with Whiskey River, as everybody knows, who's ever seen Willie Nelson at every single show. And it it is a shit-kicking song. And when you see Willie Nelson, whether it's a country fair or in a bar playing with that band, when they, you hear those opening notes of Whiskey River, everyone knows what's coming. And it still kicks everyone's ass every single time he opens with Whiskey River. And there's only two kinds of Willie Nelson fans. The kind who really, really like Willie Nelson and the kind that love Willie Nelson. <laughs> there is there is no other level of Willie Nelson. You can't. There's nobody who says, I can't stand Willie Nelson. Uh, I mean, he is, he covers the range of American music. Uh, and just to get back to Redheaded Stranger, because he's at Columbia Records now. And what, what happens with Jerry Wexler, the legendary Jerry Wexler, and there's a documentary on HBO this is the cover of Redhead a Stranger, uh, which everybody bought when it came out. Um, here's my cover of Willie and Whalen uh, of this album, which has Mamas Don't Let your, uh, your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. But this is my, uh, the, the grooves have been worn through on my version of uh, Redhead a Stranger, uh, which I highly recommend. There's also some, this one here, which I've always had. It's a bootleg album uh, put out by some sort of label called Shelby or Plantation Records, uh, which has Misery Mansion on it, Nightlife, uh, What a Way to Live. One of my also David Allen Coe is on here with Jerry Lee Lewis. This is a an interesting album, but this one here, this is a double album, uh, Willie and the Family Live. Uh, this thing was recorded, I think, in Lake Tahoe, uh, about seventy eight, I want to say. But the picture on the back shows you who we're talking about here. If people want to get a look at that. Anyway, so he goes, he get. oh, that's Jody Payne right there. That's the uh, Willie's guitar player. Um, and he, I think he's playing a Telecaster most of the time, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, Willie takes this guy, Neil Reshen, who's doing coke nonstop, and he goes into Columbia Records. And uh, Columbia Records is the biggest label in the world. This is what Jerry Wexler recommends. Jerry Wexler says they don't want to support country artists anymore. There's no money in it. And and Atlantic, to its credit, is an R&B label uh, with you know, every single person you've ever heard of an R&B from, from Ray Charles on down the line. Uh, um, you know, you'll, it's mostly uh, R&B stuff. So he lets them out of his contract. They become lifelong friends, him and Jerry Wexler, uh, which, as I said, uh, Jerry Wexler, a legend by himself. Uh, anyways, he goes to Columbia and he extracts through uh, Neil Russian, the coke fueled mad Russian manager from West 57th Street, uh, complete creative control over his albums. Final cut, final say, whatever he turns in, they got to sell, Eric. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, they got to put it out. So he comes into the head of Columbia with this with this uh, uh, tape, and it's Redheaded Stranger, and it's a concept album, like I said, about this preacher. And he says, here you go. And he goes, what is this, a demo? And he says, no, that's the finished album. He goes, get the fuck out of here. And he gets into a screaming match with the head of Columbia because they're kind of boxed in. There's nothing they could do. So the guy lost his shit. And he starts yelling at him, saying, you got to go back and polish this up. I'm not going to accept this. And Willie says, you better read the fine print of the contract because you got no choice. And they flip out. And it's really spare if you listen to Redheaded Stranger. But it's absolute freaking genius. And it puts Willie Nelson. For, of course, the album goes double platinum. Go, <laughs> so they all have to apologize to him in Columbia. And once again, Willie exposes, which he does his entire career, he exposes how little these record executives know. This happens to him all through his life. Uh, and he has such an immense, like Bob Dylan, uh, who becomes his friend, he has so much confidence in what he's doing that he's way out in front of the critics, way out in front of the fans, way out in front of these studio executives who just constantly try to undermine him uh, creatively. There's Bob on the left, Paul Simon, he loves. By the way, Bob will come up uh, with the idea for Farm Aid, Farm Aid, which you were alluding to in 1985. That was Bob's idea to help the uh, independent farmers. There were six million, and within a couple of years, we were down to two million. 
I doubt that there's even a million left in the country. These are small farmers who are crushed by corporate agriculture. This is Bob's idea, and it will become farm aid uh, in 1985, which he does every year, no matter what happens. Uh, there's still farm aid around the world uh, through Willie Nelson and his operations. But getting back to Redhead, a stranger, Willie Nelson saw this as a movie, and I just wanted to get into that. And he saw this as a movie, as an album at the same time. He has a very cinematic mind. He has a very movie-like mind. And he goes as far as to build a set for the movie, a town on his land, Eric, a town called Luck. And, and it's in the, uh, the storyline of what he's doing on the album. The town is called Luck. And he says, when you're there you're in luck. And when you leave the town, you're out of luck. <laughs> it's kind of, so it's kind of, it's kind of cute. Uh, and there's a sign in the town that says luck. Uh, but anyway, so he wants to make this movie, but the, the album, it just becomes a rocket to stardom. It, it is the blood on the tracks of Dylan for him. It is a concept album. Uh, it's the cr critically acclaimed Columbia has to eat crow. And again, he now has carte blanche to do whatever the F he wants. Now, a guy he does a duet album with who becomes his uh, other best friend is a blind black piano player named Ray Charles. And him and Ray Charles uh, bond and uh, become spiritual uh, uh, buddies and musical buddies because they both compare notes. That's him and Ray right there. They, it's a, a odd, it's talk about odd bedfellows, but... Ray had done country albums that sold through the roof. And Ray says to, to, to Willie, they tried to box me in at, at, at Atlantic as an R&B singer. And I told them to go F themselves. I am not an R&B singer. I am a country singer. And then he said, I'm not a country singer. I'm this kind of singer. Um, and I only saw Ray Charles play once. And that was at the Roosevelt Mall in Long Island outdoors with the Ray Letts, who he would touch to see if they were smoking hot or not. He would feel them and, and talk about this in the show. Uh, we had the orchestra and everything. It was a big Ray Charles, and they opened for the Jefferson Starship. I don't know how this was a bill, but uh, it was outdoors at the Roosevelt Racetrack on Long Island. Uh, but anyway, so Ray and him bond, and Ray is on Atlantic, but he sells all these country albums on different labels. Huge, huge hits. And, and they don't want to be boxed in. And him and Willie bond because Willie's got a lot of influences and Ray knows all of Willie's songs and they become, they fall in love with each other. And Willie tells this funny story when he goes over to visit Ray in his hotel room and he goes in and there's no lights on. And he goes, what's this about? He goes, now you know how I feel, right? So he never has the lights on in the hotel room and, <laughs> and he's going over to play chess which he does with Ray Charles, but the, the chess pieces are not in black and white. They're Braille chess pieces. So Willie says, I'm feeling to see which piece is which. And of course he destroys me in like 20 minutes because I don't even know how to, what pieces I have. So it's kind of an interesting relationship, but uh, uh, he, 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 he said, uh, what's his name? Roger uh, King of the road um, would come up behind um uh, Ray Charles and put his hands uh, over his eyes and just go, guess who? <laughs> you know, he heard his voice. Anyway, these guys were all playing around with Ray's uh, blind situation, jokingly. Uh, but th those two guys bond. And uh, one of the most emotional things I've ever heard was at the very end, it was Willie's, and I want to say like 70th birthday or something, one of those. And, and uh, Ray shows up and uh, they, they begin to play Georgia on my mind. Uh, Ray on piano. And he says uh, to Willie, he says, uh, Ray was on death's door. He was just about ready to die. And you could see he's frail uh, in the uh, 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 broadcast. Uh, I was watching it the other day. And and he says to Willie uh, off, ca off camera, I imagine, that he wants Willie to sing Georgia on my mind at his funeral. And Willie says, no, 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 no. You got to sing Georgia on my mind at my funeral. Right. And it was a touching little moment. You know, I got a little misty eyed over this because Ray Charles died soon after that. And Willie did do that. Uh, it was the old Hoagie Carmichael song. Uh, both of them had major hits with it. Ray Charles and Willie Nelson. Um, George on my mind is on the Stardust album. In case anybody's looking for it, the Stardust album also on Columbia becomes a mega hit 
where Willie Nelson says, I want to do jazz standards, and Columbia again has a freaking heart attack, loses their minds, and it goes to number one. It becomes, it's on the charts for over three years or something. Uh, just one of the greatest albums he ever made, uh, Stardust, uh, which has George on my mind. I think it's a second cut on the first side, if I remember correctly. Um, anyway, so he, his version of Georgia, Ray Charles' version of Georgia, uh, they they are able to intertwine with each other. Now, Willie sings off the wrong beat. His phrasing is so crazy. It's hard for people to duet, to do duets with him. Um, he's got his own phrasing and he, people believe it's, you know, more jazz oriented, like Dolly Parton, she turned him down. She said, I, I, I don't know how much weed I'd have to smoke Willie to get to your level of singing, but I can't do it. Uh, she was prob probably the only one who turned down duets uh, with Willie Nelson. And a lot of these duets don't work. Uh, the ones that do work are him with Merle Haggard. Now him and Merle Haggard become best friends um, playing poker. He is Merle's brother. I mean, him and Mer him and Merle are literally inseparable. Uh, and, and Merle it is, yeah, that this is on the bus. This is Merle on the right. Look at that stack of cash in the bottom corner, Eric. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they, these guys were serious card players uh, and also dominoes. Uh, which I still don't know how to play, but Domino's is apparently <laughs> bones. <laughs> bones, yeah. <laughs> Willie's game of choice is Domino's. You know what I mean? But um, the 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 him and Merle do Pancho and Lefty is what I was getting at. And Merle's able to sing with him because Merle can impersonate anyone. Merle can do things that nobody could do with their voice. Uh, and and Merle's able to do a duet with him. He does one with Julio Iglesias. Uh, 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 love girls that we loved and lost or something it's just crazy uh but he does these duets because he wants to just crank out albums and you go well why does he want to crank out albums well here's why he wants it. first of all he does the 85 he does the high women and there's a movie called stagecoach uh which is not very good uh and chris christopherson um is in it with johnny cash with Waylon jennings and and willie nelson plays doc holiday in that movie uh, that is not a very good movie, <laughs> but the, the, Willie, I think is on to his third wife. And I'll tell you how the third wife became the third wife. The second wife, uh, this is for the ladies at home, Shirley gets a, a, a envelope in the mail and she opens it up and it's a bill from a hospital. And she says, what is this, Willie? Oh, this, they're already living in Austin. Uh, I guess this is like 19, I want to say 70, 71 in there. Uh, she opens up the bill <laughs> and it's a bill for a childbirth in a hospital in Houston of Willie's child with another woman. And he's caught red handed, a red handed stranger. And this is the woman he had the child with. This is this is Connie. And he's still married to Shirley. Uh, but Connie will give birth, and they're the two, the two, the second child from the marriage with Connie, and he loves Connie. Uh, look, it's just he's got the bouffant going on. These two beautiful children. The older one is the one that Shirley got the bill for to pay, and uh, Willie just had to confess and throw himself on the mercy of the sword, and that was the end of that marriage. Uh, so, he, he, but he's still married to her. He has a child out of wedlock. Uh, when he hooked up with Shirley, he was still married to Martha, by the way. Uh, so the Connie marriage begins. And that's like, I want to say 1971 to 1988. I mean, these marriages are not short. They're not like I got drunk in the Elvis Chapel in Vegas and woke up and got divorced. He's he's with these women a long time um, and, and, and loves them madly and they love him. But he's kind of like a rakish. I'm trying to. See if I can explain the, the personality of Willie. He's so lovable, but he's kind of a rogue. He's kind of rakish. Eric. The rascal. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he is able to navigate as a people pleaser and a sweet guy uh, with women. And uh, it's hard to hate Willie Nelson. Let me just put it that way. Uh, Whalen, of course, completely out of control on coke and alcohol. Willie will put him in a rehab. Uh, the two men are like, uh, uh, you know, like yin and yang together. And and all of a sudden, this guy, Neil Rashen, I was telling you about, who never paid any taxes, mails a package to um, uh, uh, Whalen Jennings in Austin. 
And the package contains a lot of cocaine. And the DEA intercepts the package and arrests uh, uh, Whalen Jennings. And those goes to arrest Neil Ration. And they're both looking at some heavy time. And there's a guy, an assistant in the office. And the guy's name is, is, is Mark Rothbaum. And Mark Rothbaum is like a, a, a straight edge, veggie kind of Jewish guy from New York who's a decathlon uh, uh, guy who runs and, and does all these different athletic things. He's an assistant to uh, Neil Ration. And, and uh, he decides to take the rap. He mailed the package from the office, he says. And Whalen gets off and Neil Ration gets off, and he gets sentenced to prison. Uh, this guy, this, this kid, uh, uh, Mark Rothbaum. And Mark Rothbaum, because he did this, Willie Nelson fires his manager, Neil Ration, and he says, Mark Rothbaum is my new manager. But, and everybody goes, but he's in prison, Willie. He goes, I don't care. I've never seen such heroism in my life. And it's really true. The kid realizes that Whalen Jennings is, is fucked, and Neil Ration is fucked, and he takes the rap saying, I mailed the package to uh, Austin. And he go, gets sentenced to a year in, or two years in prison, federal prison. Uh, it was a DEA uh, uh, bust. And in the prison, <laughs> begins to book gigs for Willie Nelson and has Willie Nelson appear in the prison and perform. And because of everyone liking him, he gets out after three months, uh, uh, Rothbaum. So he's released from prison because he brought Willie Nelson to play in the prison. And yeah, so here's here's Mark Rothbaum, who is still his manager today. And Willie Nelson said it was the most heroic thing he, I've ever seen. He hires him and he becomes his manager and he's still his manager now, which is an incredible story. Uh, by the way, Neil Ration also had one other uh, client, and that was a real uh, 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 argumentative, dark uh, musician. <laughs> no, you're close. Miles oh. Davis. Miles Davis. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Miles Davis. But anyway, so uh, Rothbaum, who's a pretty brilliant guy, a uh, real genius, real straight edge, not a coke guy, he's not into drugs, total health freak. Uh, <laughs> look at that shot. Whoa. Very interesting. Wow. Uh, he, he begins to try to straighten out Willie's career. Now, all of a sudden, they pull, you know, they, in 1990, they pull the buses in, they're back from a tour, and all of a sudden, these agents come out of nowhere, and they padlock Willie's uh, garage, his house, they take the buses, they take his furniture, they seize every single thing he owns, and I mean everything, like a lightning strike, not like, here's a letter, come talk to us in the office. Uh, they physically, physically take everything, and he's given a tax bill for 36 million dollars eric out of the blue yeah 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 and because this guy neil ration was keep, neil ration was keeping the money and partying and never paid the irs it's not willie's fault but it is it's his thing there's nothing you could do about it uh he's on the hook for 36 million dollars and they can't use any of their things they can't use their buses their equipment the studio there's nothing they took his desk they took his gold records his clothing Every freaking thing he owned, including his wife's stuff, uh, it, it was really shocking, like a lightning strike force. In 1990, 19, they came down on him. So he goes to uh, meet with them. He's trying to negotiate with them in, in, in Austin. And he brings uh, one of the other, he gets another bus from the company. This is like, I think, Honeysuckle Rose 5. He got like five buses out of this one company that worshipped him. And he begins to try to negotiate with the IRS and he thinks, and Willie shows up for this thing and he brings one of the buses and parks it outside on purpose because what happens? Thousands of fans begin to circle around the bus. They go, look, it's Willie's bus in front of the IRS headquarters, Eric. Now keep in mind, Austin's the capital of Texas and that's where he has to go for the IRS. And he goes in and he thinks they're gonna bring down some New York accountant, some harsh guy in a suit, but instead, it's some good old boy from Dallas who's a fan of Willie Nelson. And he's going, well, can I call you Willie? And he goes, yeah. And he starts to grill Willie Nelson. It's a trap. It's a, they, instead of bringing down some harsh Jewish accountant from New York, they got some good old boy from Dallas, a young guy uh, who was a Willie fan to try to you know, interrogate him and find out where the assets are. And one of the assets they're looking for 
is Trigger. And Trigger has been given to Mark Rothbaum. Trigger has been smuggled out of the country. They want Trigger. The IRS knows the value of this guitar. Rothbaum has it smuggled out, not the country, the continental United States, to uh, Maui, to some property that he's got a house in, uh, had a house in, in Maui. And, they, and Trigger uh, is being protected by one of his daughters. So, but the IRS wants Trigger in the worst way. They have everything else. So Willie doesn't know what to do, and he doesn't want to declare bankruptcy because he's told if you declare bankruptcy, every ticket sale you ever get is going to go directly to the IRS for the rest of your life, and uh, your creditors are fucked. And so he doesn't want to do that. So he says, how about this? How about if I do an album just for the IRS called the IRS Tapes? And Willie puts out an album, makes a deal with the IRS, and sells this on late night TV. It's, it's, I wish I could find the commercials going, ha, ah, this is Will and Elson. Help me pay off my debt to the IRS. And he writes all these original great songs. And it's a great album. And it's sold on late night TV. And the money goes to the IRS to pay off the debt. But before that happens, the IRS begins to have auctions. There's film footage of these auctions, by the way, which you can find on, on, on YouTube. They're in a couple of documentaries where they begin to auction off Willie's personal items in like these Texas auctions with an auctioneer and there's a big crowd and they're buying stuff. So what happens is Willie's friends show up at the auction and begin to buy. It's really a choking up thing. They buy his stuff back and they give it to him, including Bobby's piano and uh, some other personal items that they decide the government's not going to get out of Willie and his own friends buy the shit back. Uh, and give it to him and protect it, which is really a profound thing. So the I, it's like Willie versus the IRS is uh, becomes he becomes a late night joke on Leno and these talk shows at night. And this is pot smoking guy who it really, really takes a hit on his uh, his career, uh, uh, you know, PR wise that he did this. With, yeah, this is it. The IRS tapes who buy my memories, uh, which is a great song. Uh, by the way, um, and the other songs on there are great too. And there's like an 800 numbers to to order it. I remember this running late night on TV. Uh, so Willie's having trouble, uh, as you can imagine, 1992. Uh, the number one son that he has is Billy Nelson. And Billy Nelson is the, the, the son of his father. Billy Nelson is going to inherit like Hank Jr., the mantle of his father and Billy Nelson in 1992 hangs himself Christmas day, uh, in his house. And he had had problems with drugs and alcohol, um, him, o over the years, but, uh, it, this devastates Willie that his oldest son, uh, does this to himself. Um, and so that happens at the same time. Uh, it, there's just a series of setbacks, you know, in, in 1988, he, he gets divorced from Connie and he hooks up with, uh, this is on a, the set of one of these movies, I think Barbarossa or Honeysuckle Rose, I forget which one it was, uh, a makeup hair lady, a hairdressing uh, makeup person. And the, the director wants to cut Willie Nelson's dreadlocks. And the hairdresser, whose name is Annie, an Italian woman, uh, in 1991, uh, says, I wouldn't do that. Your hair is beautiful. So he marries her. Uh, she becomes... Mrs. Willie Nelson, number four. Uh, and Annie uh, is an Italian. Uh, there she is now. That, that's her um, at the Grammys with him. She becomes the wife that he still has right now. So it's, it's 1991 to today. That's 30 some odd years with Annie. Uh, she's really his, his rock. And she, all of them have kids with him. I think he's got seven kids, four eight. wives, eight kids. Okay, it's hard to keep up. Uh, four wives. The two kids, uh, Micah and the other Nelson, uh, are both guitar players who tour with Willie. Uh, they're from her. Uh, they're her kids. And uh, one of them looks just like him. The other one, not so much. But the one young Willie Nelson, uh, who plays a Telecaster and sings at on the shows, is an amazing uh, lookalike of Willie. Uh, I forget the name of that, that one kid. There's his kids. <laughs> wow. wow holy crap i think crap. there might be grandkids in the mix but he's got no I, wow him. look at all that you're right oh my god so he goes to the bahamas willie uh there's two things i wanted to tell you 1976 he 
becomes friends with a, a guy from Georgia, uh, becomes president of the United States, uh, and that's uh, Jimmy Carter. And mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, there's the two boys, right? Yeah, uh, with Willie, the the one on the the hat is the uh, I, the singer guitar player. The other one plays guitar as well. Um, but he becomes friends with Jimmy Carter in 1976. And Jimmy Carter is big on farming and farm aid, and this will come in 1985. But um, he backs Jimmy Carter and does a series of uh, concerts while Jimmy's running for president. Jimmy, uh, there's Jimmy and Rosalind. They will come up and sing with him uh, at the end of the show, um, uh, Amazing Grace or whatever it was. The final songs would be of the show. Rosalind could actually sing. I don't know about Jimmy, but he, when they become president, uh, when he becomes president, he has. Uh, Willie come and give a concert on the South Lawn. Uh, uh, this might be at the White House. Probably not. It's probably at one of the picnics here with Jimmy. Uh, anyway, so he gives this concert in the back lawn of the White House. And one of the staff members, which Willie has never revealed, uh, was an old friend of Willie's. And he takes Willie and shows him around the White House uh, late at night. And he takes Willie to the roof of the White House where they light up a joint and start smoking on the White House roof. And the guy's going, there's a, there's the Washington Monument. There's this. He starts pointing out all the things on the roof with Willie Nelson smoking weed up there on the roof. I always thought that was a great image. And I don't know who it is. Willie never revealed who that guy was, I guess, for national security reasons. But it was Wasn't some there someone else smoking weed in the Carter administration White House. That you've mentioned well, I, yeah, I do know that that uh, Cher, <laughs> Cher told me that her and uh, Greg Allman smoke weed. And they always end up in the Lincoln bedroom. Apparently, they put Cher and Greg Allman in the Lincoln bedroom. And they put Willie Nelson and his wife in the Lincoln bedroom as well. Uh, uh, I, guess, I guess that was Connie at the time. And so anyway, so he goes upstairs on the roof and they're smoking weed on the roof of the White House, which I thought was kind of a profound thing. But he goes on a vacation, Willie, with his with his uh, uh, I think it was I want to say Hank Cochran, this uh, another music writer, uh, a songwriter friend of his. I think it was Hank Cochran. They go to the Bahamas and Willie's into golf now. He's into all kinds of stuff. And uh, their luggage gets lost. They go to the hotel. They get a call from the Bahamian, uh, whatever they are, there, uh, authorities uh, at the airport. And they go, oh, we found your luggage. He goes to pick it up. And uh, they said, this is your luggage. He goes, yeah. And he says, uh, I'll, I'll just take it and go now. And they go, wait a minute. And they open it up and there's Willie's jeans on top of the luggage. And the guy says, we just want to make sure this is your luggage. He goes, yeah, this is my luggage. He goes, okay, good. So he reaches into the pocket of the jeans. He pulls out a bag of dope and they take Willie away in handcuffs and put him in a Bahamian jail. And uh, he just says to his his friend, I think it was Hank Cochran, says, good luck, Willie. I'll see you when you get out. And he's like making jokes. And they're taking Willie away to some Bahamian jail. And he's in this Bahamian jail. And a day later, his friend comes to see him. He brings him a six pack of beer when Willie's already quit drinking, but he's in jail. I guess you could bring somebody a six pack of beer in this Bahamian jail. And he can't get out because he's got, you know, maybe a quarter ounce or a half ounce of pot. Who knows how much was in his jeans pocket, for Christ's sakes. And somehow they go before the judge and he's looking at it. The bail was like half a million dollars. They couldn't get it. It would have to be wired to the, the Bahamas and they won't let him out. And he goes before the judge. And the, the uh, lawyer says, you know, Mr. Nelson has done this charity, this charity, this charity. And the judge says, I don't give a shit. Says, I'm, I'm in the Bahamas. I don't care what you're talking about. And a guy with a wig on, you know, some black dude with a white wig from uh, British style uh, justice. And uh, anyway, so he says, I am willing to let you go if you agree never to return to the Bahamas again. And Willie just yells out from the bench, you got a deal. <laughs> and the guy lets him go and they escape the Bahamas never to return, which I always thought was a kind of funny story. And when he meets Jimmy Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter says, how is your vacation in the Bahamas? Apparently Carter intervened and did something to get him out of the Bahamas. That's why I was telling mm. this story. And, and he just smirked about it. Uh, and, 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 and and you know made a joke and they did something to get him out of there amazing well anyway so that leads to farm aid in 1985 uh which he does do and that raises originally like the first one raises ra raises about seven million dollars uh for bankrupt farmers and willie talks about how these farmers were committing 
you know what to themselves i won't mention uh there's neil young he helps out and that is on the right john uh, mellencamp oh mellencamp's involved in this thing yeah johnny johnny cougar doesn't he change his he was, well, he was johnny cougar then he was john cougar then john cougar mellencamp then john mellencamp okay he had just to do to, it yeah right enough. just to know the transition anyway that's john mellencamp uh little pink houses all in a row neil young apparently loves the farmers i i guess he was in on it uh mm -hmm. bob loved the farmers it was bob's idea uh so anyway so he he, he does farm and continues to do movies like barbarossa uh and then he, like i said he he makes this movie independent movie called redheaded stranger uh, uh with morgan fairchild who is stunning in this movie and has a scene with her things are kind of exposed over here in a creek that I, I recommend for my male friends. But if you love Morgan Fairchild, you'll love this movie. He's a preacher that comes to some shithole town and uh, uh, it's really a violent town. And, and uh, it's the, the movie version of the album is all I could say. And he um, raises the money independently outside the studio system, makes his own movie. And, and that I thought was pretty good because it looks like a good movie. It's, it looks real. And he does Barbarossa where he plays another outlaw with Gary Busey. Gary Busey coming off of uh, the Buddy Holly story um, uh, was the hottest actor in town. And uh, oh yeah, there's Morgan Fairchild. She looks so great in this movie, ladies and men. Uh, if you're a Morgan Fairchild fan, check, check out if you could find it. I don't know if, if it's available. Um, in your area but if you can find it on youtube uh it's well it's well worth watching that as a guy who decides to make his own movie uh out of his album you know uh anyway so he continues to do these movies which eventually leads to one with miami vice he's a drug lord or somebody in miami vice and uh uh he does uh, this barbarossa with gary Busey. gary Busey playing you know um uh, uh, so hot as in the buddy holly story uh, Buddy Holly, of course, dying in a plane crash that Waylon Jennings was supposed to be on. Mm. Uh, very interesting li links of all these dots to each other. Uh, Waylon goes to rehab. Waylon gets out of rehab. Uh, they put together the highwaymen. Uh, and uh, Johnny Cash says to him, you know, you've recorded with everyone in the world. But me, what gives? And they put together this thing, the four of them. And it is great. It, uh, the, the two Highwaymen albums, um, they stay together for 10 years. Uh, it, it is great. Their voices meld together perfectly. The songs are great. Of course, that, that's Johnny Cash and, and Chris Christopherson on the extreme right, Whalen and then Willie on the left. Uh, this is after Whalen and Willie become a duo uh, the, as the two outlaws, uh, you know, doing mega songs together. But it's a funny thing, like I was alluding to earlier in the show, Whalen senses that Willie's getting too big for his britches and uh, Willie buys the Tex or owns a part of the Texas Opry House in Austin and begins to put on concerts there. And Willie becomes to be gets to be hero worshipped by everyone in Austin. And people are saying he's the king of, of country music uh, in Austin. And 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 Whalen Jennings will famously write Bob Wills is still the king. And Bob and he goes into and books himself in the Texas Opry House in Willie's backyard, so he could go up there and sing this song with Willie in the audience uh, about Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. And uh, uh, when you're down in Texas, Bob Wills is still the king, and and he's singing this right at Willie Nelson, and he expects to get into a fight with him afterwards, Wellen, because Wellen loves to fight, and Willie wouldn't take the bait. And he just says, a great song, Waylon. And he goes, what about the lyrics? He goes, yeah, pretty good lyrics. He goes, what do you make of them? And he wouldn't take the bait, Willie, but he got the message that Waylon was delivering. Now, and again, this is not Willie doing this. This was the media saying that Willie was the king of country music. And Waylon wanted to remind him that one year down in Texas, Bob Wills is still the king. And he was right. He was right. Uh, and Willie agrees. And it's one of B Willie's biggest influences is Bob Wills. And Whalen also, and many other people, uh, because these people like Johnny Gimbel, uh, who will later play with Willie, who is the violinist, is like a Stefan Grappelli swing violinist. Uh, Tommy Duncan, one of the great vocalists of all time, will sing in Bob Wills' orchestra. 
and many other people, including Willie's uh, second wife, was involved in singing with that. So, I mean, and, and again, that, that 14 year old Willie booking Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys as a kid to come to his town. I, I, I just find that to be one of the great stories of all time uh, of Willie's, Willie's career. But it, it, look, Willie is not going to be around much longer. That's why there's Bob Wills, of course, one of my heroes, obviously. Bob Wills invents Western swing at the same time that Count Basie is swinging in Chicago and New York has Duke Ellington swinging. None of them know each other. There's like a musical collective unconsciousness that people have talked about. And this regional stuff uh, happens simultaneously with Count Basie in Chicago and Duke Ellington in New York and, and Bob Wills in Texas. All three separate organizations, orchestras are swinging. And uh, uh, I don't know how that happens. Uh, you know, it's some sort of collective unconsciousness of music in general, uh, but just a fascinating situation and why we are separate from all other countries on the earth because of our music. Nobody has this. There's no music in Europe. There's no music anywhere. If you look at any film, they just use American music wherever they can. Otherwise, it's electric dance music, electronic dance music in a club. Uh, if you go anywhere in the world, it's just electronic dance music. Only we have real music. And look, I, I watched Bernie Taupin get in, uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last night. And I remembered a Tumbleweed Connection coming out in 1970, one of the great albums of all time, with an obscure cat named Elton John playing piano on it. And all these songs were written by Bernie Taupin. And Bernie Taupin said famously he had never been to America, hadn't been here yet. And he modeled the band after music from Big Pink by the band. And he got into Americana and the whole album, Tumbleweed Connection, which is a fantastic album, is kind of like Redheaded Stranger in 1970. And it's a an whole outlaw record of songs, uh, Burn Down the Mission and, and a bunch of other great songs. I recommend you find that album if you, if you still can. Uh, because that put Elton John on the map before he went disco, before he went gay, before he went glitter. Uh, this was the album that I bought in 1970 called Tumbleweed Connection, written by Bernie Taupin uh, uh, for Elton John to sing. And he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last night, along with Willie Nelson. Um, yeah, here's Bernie Taupin, one of the great songwriters, who was British. Uh, uh, at, but he was he was somehow collectively, unconsciously, melding with the roots music of America through the band's album that he had listened to and studying Western culture from afar, from England. Uh, Taupin, and, and he admits this in interviews, Taupin, how he, he intentionally did this and hadn't even been here yet and tapped into outlaw cowboy culture uh, in 1970 uh, based on what he had heard and seen through movies and magazines and books and albums. Uh, the influence of our music, as we pointed out in other episodes around the world, uh, is enormous. And it's because of all these different musical cultures melding together uh, and overlapping. And it, it's what separates us from other cultures in the world. You can listen to mariachi all you want until you shoot yourself in the head and other types of folk music. I mean, each country has their own kind of music. But I'm talking about mass popular music. Uh, that is what separates us from the rest of the world. And, and, and people who have come here uh, from other countries will attest to that. We're kind of used to it. But, you know, this is what Willie's thing was. He was able to hear Django Reinhardt playing in, in France with Stefan Grappelli, uh, who, you know, R Django being a gypsy, a, Roma a, Romanian, a Romanian gypsy, uh, but they were playing jazz over there. And, you know, it wasn't the greatest jazz in the world because they were playing it in France. But... Uh, Django Reinhardt was such an amazing gypsy guitar player that Willie stole from him and Willie stole from various people, uh, from Ray Price, you know, from, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, from Haggard, from these people, and was able to uh, form, is that Ray Price? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, look at that. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, I mean, Willie, if I could say anything about Willie, it didn't happen overnight. He paid his dues. He went through the Nashville grind, uh, uh, Nashville being this, you know, straight laced corporate situation. But Willie, since the time he was seven years old, um, knew that he was going to be a huge star and had the ambition and the work ethic. And it's pure. And he talks about God and country so much early on. 
uh, later on, his politics will become more libertarian. He will become a member of the board for normal. He would fight for the normalization of marijuana, uh, the legalization. I mean, it becomes his pet project, as we all know. Um, you know, he stopped drinking alcohol and switched to pot. Um, you know, whatever that means. It, it was able to work for him. Um, having four wives may attest to some sort of problem with intimate relationships, but nevertheless, uh, Willie, uh, if you ask him about his politics, it's, it's the politics of leave people alone. And he talks about this growing up in Abbott, Texas, how nobody got into anybody's business. And it's kind of a libertarian, uh, ethics, Eric, right. You know, where you're just leaving the other person alone to do their thing. Uh, you know, he, he obviously bonded with the Jimmy Carter thing, but uh, he talks about some other people as being liberals and he talks about others as being conservatives. Uh, he seems to be a, a hands off kind of libertarian. And uh, in, in, although involved, he was involved in many liberal causes, obviously, giving money to a lot of crap uh, like that. <laughs> and, that and that's and that's raw. That's 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 a, a mark on the left. That's Rothbaum on the left, by the way. Um, but yeah, so, but I think politically, uh, if, if pinned down, he would identify as a libertarian. Um, but I have a feeling he's a pretty cool dude because if you look at the circles he travels in, I mean, he's hanging out with some very well-known leftists doing farm aid, but then a lot of country has a lot of right wing. So I think he probably had to bridge a bit of a gap and just get into roots and country and just getting on. Well, he, he said, I don't care what your politics are. I mean, he said that to Johnny Cash. He said that to Waylon Jennings, who was far more conservative than him. They were they were riding him unmercifully about becoming a hippie. And then, you know, Waylon grows his hair long and doesn't, you know, essentially become a hippie. But um, it, it was just let people do what they want. I mean, his ethos was that it, leave people alone. He doesn't care what you're your politics are. He says this repeatedly. And this is among his close friends. It's among his own his own people, he says this. You know, so I, I think he really must mean it at this point in his life. Well, they're I, friends for a long time. So yeah. I'm going to guess that politics didn't get in the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, but I mean, he, if, if one artist, I mean, besides Bob uh, D., <laughs> who we're going to do an episode on eventually because Bob D is on the same uh, plane as Willie. Um, I mean, I'm more of a Bob Dylan fan than I'm a Willie Nelson fan, but nevertheless, Willie covers, and there's Bob, Willie covers <laughs> so much about Americana. If you grew up in the seventies, uh, obviously it goes back to the thirties and forties, but he covers such a broad spectrum of politics and music and art and pop culture that I thought it was time you know, for us to do a show on him because he's not going to be around much longer, unfortunately. What's up? His sister died last year at 91. Yeah. I think his grandmother lived to be almost 90. So he's got yeah. some genes. He might oh, have a yeah. few years. He might. And, and look at all the abuse he did to himself, too. But I guess, you know, maybe weed keeps you young. Who knows? It, it could be. Mm -hmm. could be. Amazing. We've got a bunch of uh, super chats that have come in over the show. Um let me see. Question: Since you're a fan of Western swing, are you familiar course, with the Spade yeah. Cooley story? Of course, of course. Yeah. No, no, uh, I'm a big Western swing fan. I've been for many, many years. Johnny Winter. <laughs> you knew Johnny Winter, right? Or no, Edgar? I know Edgar. I don't. Okay. I didn't ever knew. John. I've seen Johnny play, uh, but I, I, I know Edgar Winter pretty well. Amazing. Yeah. Um, wait, wait. Go back. What did that say? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Johnny Winter was my guitar hero. He signed my 1976 Gibson Bicentennial Firebird at the Lone Star Cafe in 1980. Right, right. that's, that's, a, that's nice what I mentioned, guitar. the Lone Star, because that's where we hung out in New York. With Oh, it's Al Gonzalez. Um, yeah. I didn't real. I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was Al Gonzalez. The um, yeah, we hung out at the Lone Star a lot, and and that was one of our uh, our mainstay places was at the Lone Star. And and some of the greatest people I've ever seen play played at that. And not a big place. I had the lizard on the roof, as Al remembers. Uh, did a lot of drinking in the Lone Star. All right. Um, John McGill, best Willie Nelson song. Someone, somebody pick up my pieces, Mark. Watch HBO's Estonia, 1994 disaster, 876 deaths. Literally covered up with rocks. Any insight? I, I don't know what Estonia, <clears throat> the country? 
I don't know what that's it about. might be. I mean, if it's I, if I it is a country, it's not an American story. So yeah, it's not an America's nothing. untold story, and I don't really uh, get along well much anymore with HBO. Uh, but yeah, that's a great Willie song. That's a great, great Willie song. Uh, my friend Susanna Clark did the album artwork on Willie Stardust album. I knew her ex husband in Sacramento. Wow. Um, yeah, Thanks I mean it's you. a great album. I, I don't know about the cover that much. It just is a star with a blue background. <laughs> not, there's not much on that cover, but. Look, it's a classic album, and it's fantastic. I think everybody should get a copy of Stardust and um, and listen to that record. I mean, because it is a classic, classic album. All right. Uh, Mo Bishop. Edgar Casey is from my hometown. Is pr pretty announced Casey, prominent family in my town. Oh, I'm just saying what Willie pronounces it, so. Um, Big Bill 767, as an Air Force pilot, I flew low over Willie's golf course <laughs> the day after the July 4th, 1979 party. You have never seen so many beer cans or lost clothes. Look, it's a party. What can you say? I mean, uh, thank God that Willie didn't become a jet pilot and attack North Korea. That's all I could tell you. Yeah, actually, on that no, somebody pinged me on Twitter and sent a DM saying, um, I see the Willie stream for today. I'll give you a quick story. My dad told me he was an Illinois state police lieutenant. And when Willie would play the state fair, they would have to pay him in cash due to his IRS liabilities. They would literally drive to the bank and hand him cash even on Sunday. Also, he had a rider in his contract um, that he would have so many cases of Lone Star Bill, beer delivered to his bus after the show and he would drink with everyone. Well, that's, that's not radical. Uh, my dad's best friend and fellow ISP would say, and this is spanning the late 60s and 80s, that the worst crowd to do security for was oh, the Willie concert at the state fair. The state police said that the crowd would do whatever Willie would say. He could have ordered them to attack the police, and uh, the crowd would. Yeah, get, that's a lot of bullshit. That's a lot of bullshit. Well, he's popular. That's all they're saying. Yeah. It's, it's probably like Trump. He's going to attack the crowd. What are you, the he's Willie not crowd, was, that. He's saying that it could happen. It's like the worst Trump. crowd that, that they ever had. Was it a Willie Nelson picnic? A Willie Nelson concert? I don't know. Um, it's It could be like Trump saying, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue or whatever. Anyway, yeah. go on. Um, Pasha, when I saw today's topic, I started wondering how long it would take for ah! the monk reference to pop up. Turns out not long. All right. Yeah, Tom, no, I mean, I, the monk story, that's one of the great monk episodes of all times. You got to, you got to check it out with Willie on there. And I think he, uh, my uh, friend says she, that, uh, there's another episode with Willie that we're looking for. He comes back. So <laughs> I'll report back on Friday when I find the Willie episode. All right. Carl Burkhalter. Thanks from South Texas. Thank you. All right. Texas in the house. Thank you. Kim Upperman. Fantastic segment, Mark and Eric. Yeah. Willie moves to Houston at one point and he almost loses his mind in Houston because uh, he hates living there. Um, this is before he went to Nashville, but um, uh, South, you know, I talk about different places in Texas. Willie has lived. All Thanks, right. Kim. Uh, Trey Ellswick worked, worked for Willie many times. Best yeah. people ever. Right. Biggest blessing of my life. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it's, everybody says that. Everyone on earth says that. No, he continues. Willie. Yeah. Um, Willie Nelson is the most intelligent, yeah. engaging, humble man you'll ever meet. Absolutely true. Um, oh, by the way, Willie <laughs> declared after he's got into the weed that, that nobody could do cocaine on the bus anymore. And he famously said, if you're wired, you're fired. And uh, he explained it in some detail. He said, cocaine makes you into your own higher power. It makes you God. And uh, that will lead to you being an asshole. So I couldn't have anyone around me doing cocaine on the tour uh, any longer. So the mantra was if on Willie's uh, buses, and there came like three of them, uh, if you're wired, you're fired. All right. Um and probably personal experience with Waylon Jennings on that. Yeah. Well, he this didn't begrudge Waylon doing coke. Again, he's no, no, the no, most. He could have had encounters with him. And that oh, no, no. Of course he did. But I'm, he's not. He wasn't judgmental. He says many hmm. times, he says, I didn't judge Waylon for what he did. He couldn't have because he himself had been such a crazy drunk mm -hmm. and had done so many crazy things that he couldn't judge others. Sure. Um, Count de Monet. A, um, AUS on SRV, maybe? Maybe, Stevie yeah. Ray? I mean, I love Stevie Ray Vaughan. I saw Stevie Ray play a number of times. One of the most tragic stories uh, 
in rock and roll history is the death of Stevie Ray Vaughan. I mean, and uh, Jimmy Vaughan, obviously, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Kim Wilson from the uh, Thunderbirds, one of my favorite harp players, uh, other than uh, Mickey Raphael among the white harp players. Uh, uh, so maybe, uh, maybe we can combine both Vaughan brothers into one story. Don't but I'm, wear I'm wearing my kind of my Texas country outfit here. Nobody's commenting on it, but I'm going. We Texas. got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan reminded when you were talking about um, Trigger and the wear on the guitar, it made me think of Stevie Ray Vaughan, who also had his picks. Um, Firestar and Stain guitar Trigger. Yeah, no, it's 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 a it's a thing, you know. And Mickey says, if 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 Trigger dies, it's the end of the, it's the end of the act. Like they talk about Trigger like it's a human being, which I always found. And they're not making a joke. I mean, Trigger is a thing. Well, and um, wasn't B.B. King that also had the uh, guitar? Well, Lucille. Lucille, but I don't think it's that level of of uh, linkage. Um, <clears throat> so Willie and Chris Christopherson used to rent a house directly across the lake from me. Wow. When they played Reno every year. Wow. One of his best songs, he was singing with Bob Dylan at Willie's 60th birthday, singing Van Zant's Poncho and Right, Lefty. right. It was Town Van Zant's, uh, another great singer, songwriter, Poncho and Lefty. Uh, he's, uh, he's, Pat is right about that. Uh, I don't know where that was, but that's a great story. Thank you. Yeah, Reno, somewhere in Reno. Reno, okay. Well, I'm not sure. Well, uh, amazing story. Um, next, we have Freeform Friday coming up, but we've still got to hang out a bit with locals. And I'm willing to bet that there's probably a few tips and questions there to continue this discussion. I hope um, everyone considers following us. You can follow us for free on Locals, including what we're going to talk about next. And if you want to support us, it will not um, depress us in any way. Mark, well, I hope we didn't get demonetized today. Did we say anything oh, wrong? Oh, we did. We got demonetized early. What? But hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, I can what, overcome. What? How I don't you know, hate Willie I'll Nelson? I don't know. They, they don't hate Willie Nelson. They hate us. Oh, but, <laughs> in, in, in all fairness. Wow. We could do yeah. a story about Mr. Rogers and get demonetized. Probably. Probably. But hopefully they, um, hopefully we win the appeal sooner than later. That's part of folks why we are going to locals because locals, all and, of you and, are and locals. Rumble and Rumble, yeah, yeah you, you help take care of us. And actually, let me double check Rumble because I've been so bit deep in this trying to find images, etc. Any Rumble rants? There are no Rumble rants. So. You know, it's uh, there's a great story about Farron Young, who has a huge hit with Hello Walls, uh, 1962. And and Willie gets a royalty check for $20,000, and he runs into Tootsie's uh, uh, bar, and there's Farron Young, and he tongue kisses him. <laughs> he was so excited about it. Well, then. <laughs> that That's an insane story. But everybody, follow us over to Locals. And if you don't, that's fine. We hope to see you on Freeform Friday. Is this show okay? Do people like this, what we did? I think so. Okay. I think so. Very, very busy chat. I mean, there's a lot of other Willie Nelson stories. I mean, I could go on forever, but I think that about sums it up. All right. All right.